everybody and we're on to our next session again um, before I introduce what this session is going to be about I'd really like to just welcome you back if you dropped off halfway or if you've just started to join us welcome everybody and I just wanted to remind you that the topic for day one it's um, based on workplace well-being as a theme, right? And I really would just like to summarize three key points from the other sessions that we had, you know, listened to earlier. And some of the prominent ones that came up, apart from cockroach, um, was, you know, the importance for leaders to really walk the talk and how top-down behavior from leadership is absolutely crucial at all levels to ensure that, any company culture is successful when you know you provide mental health resources um, or benefits to the employees in an attempt or rather to achieve talent retention because losing a talent really expensive quoting Gilberto over there and so I guess you know moving on from that as a segue we also want to talk about in this session some of the workplace perception disparity on mental health. And let me just walk you through a little bit about what inspired today's session. So interesting perspective on two ends of the dichotomy here, CEOs and employees. So 96% of CEOs think that what they're doing is enough for employee mental health. Yet only 69% of employees actually agree with them. And ironically, the numbers are flipped as well, to the two ends of the spectrum. Okay, yes, I, I, I know I didn't have to call it out, but it was like really, really exciting for me. So today we have with us uh, on the panel to talk about how we can bridge this disparity in the workplace when we talk about mental health benefits in MNCs and SMEs alike. So let's see who's on the panel today. Right, so chairing it will be Ellen, our very own global head of sales from Intellect. And then we also have Erica joining us from Hong Kong. She's a well-being consultant at Aon with a specialty in communications. So since joining Aon in 2019, she has helped create healthier workforces in Asia Pacific by advising companies on their corporate well-being initiatives. So she served as a Mind Hong Kong ambassador and is certified in mental health first aid. So our next speaker, Dr. Claire, is going to be very happy to hear that. <laughs> And then on to you, Julian. He's also based in Hong Kong, right? The land of Kim Sum. I am so jealous, but I have no money to fly over there yet. But Julian is the co-founder at Alia and Healthy Matters, a digital health platform. So his mission really is to empower people with trusted health info. And I think trusted is a really important word. And not just info, right, but advice so that they can truly make the best choices for themselves and their families and everyone around them. So prior to entrepreneurship, Julian spent 13 years in financial services. Seriously, respect. I don't know how you do it, but so dry like from my perspective. So that's why respect. In Paris, New York, and Hong Kong. Okay, so in the spirit of um, being in Hong Kong and Cantonese intellect, anyway, uh, always me being so silly. But Erica, Julian, really, from my side, I want to say a big personal thank you for all the work that you do every day, right? I mean, giving advice to people, giving advice to organizations really is a step change. And the more we talk about it, the more it becomes a reality. So I hope you know enough how important the work that you're doing is. If nobody told you enough, then let it be from me today. Okay, won't steal any more time because MCs only have five minutes. So I'm going to pass over this session to Alan and have this awesome conversation with all of you. And just one last note for our beautiful 227 audiences. Can we just get your help to put in any questions that you might have in the Q&A uh, icon or rather that feature so that we could actually post your question on screen uh, when you ask it. Okay. All right, Meg, stop talking. Alan, start talking. See you guys. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Mag. I, I thought this conversation was going to go into Cantonese and palindromes, but I think we're here to, fortunately, continue our, our mental health festival. You know, thank you again, Erica and Julian, for, for attending today. And um, just really lovely to see two 
human capital experts uh, participating in our panel. So thank you again. And I know we, we in the backstage talked about Hong Kong and really seeing some, I think earlier this week on the, the positive developments of scrapping the hotel quarantine and, and certainly moving forward on, on the reintegration. So lovely to see that and certainly hope that's a elevating uh, me me mental health experience for both the people in Hong Kong and, and certainly for ones who want to come and visit as well. But um, you know, let's let's just dive right in. We have about maybe forty minutes or so um, on on this really uh, great topic. And again, we, I just to kind of go back and look at the the question again about again the the context was mental health care becoming less of a taboo across modern workplaces, and and there that's that disconnect with employees wondering you know feeling as if they don't have that need, and and certainly with that statistic as well. So the first question I wanted to, to ask the both you two was really asking you your perspective as to why this is why this is this the case, why is this the situation and that disparity uh, at that perspective and where it's coming from. Maybe, maybe Eric, I'll, I'll start with you first. Sure, thanks, Alan. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Mag, for the wonderful and very kind introduction. And thank you to the Intellect team for having me on this panel today. Um, I appreciate the first question. I feel like we could spend 40 minutes just talking about that in and of itself. Um, but you know, this is a disparity that is so important to talk about, and I'm glad that we have the session to do so today. Um, so from my point of view, I think that there's kind of three key drivers that might be influencing this perception gap of employers or CEOs thinking that they're doing enough for employees, and employees not necessarily thinking that's the case. I think one, there's the disparity between resources provided but versus actual utilization of those resources. So from a C-suite point of view, there might be a perception that an organization is providing enough support. They might have a range of mental health programs, mental health apps, EAP, um, but are those benefits actually fit for purpose for an employee's need? And what is the actual utilization of those benefits? Um, if that's not up to par for what an employee actually needs at the end of the day, then those resources might not be as effective as possible. The second I would say is the disparity between leadership buy-in and communications and organizational culture and communications. So even if you have the best, most vocal leadership around employee mental health, this type of support needs to be understood and felt really day-to-day -day by employees. So if internal communications around mental health only come at the point of onboarding or once a year during World Mental Health Day, that culture is not necessarily felt every day throughout the organization and employees may not know where to go if they need help. Um, so signposting on a consistent basis is so important, as is equipping managers with the right tools and uh, conversational tactics to support employees related to mental health, which I know we'll talk about later. Um, and kind of likewise, there's also a disparity between maybe the feedback received at a C-suite level versus true and honest perceptions on the ground. So psychological safety, which I re-looked up the definition because I think it's a word that we throw around and take for granted, but psychological safety is defined as the ability to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences of self-image, status, or career. So while organizations are growing in the way that they measure and collect feedback, there still might be hesitation to provide a true and an honest opinion around him, how employees are doing day-to-day -day work, as well as their perceptions of resources. So without a cohesive measurement framework, or maybe without enough psychological safety to provide honest feedback, there may be that perception gap between what is viewed at the top as potentially successful, but what's potentially lacking from broader employees. Oh, thank you so much. Um, really beautifully put with, with the three points and, and you can clearly see some uh, unique tensions across uh, the, the various metrics that you pointed out. So that's uh, very fascinating. Uh, Julian, what, what, uh, what is your, uh, your take on this question? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for, for having me. Uh, great intro by Mag. Uh, you were right, my previous life was a bit dry, which is why I jumped into a second one, or invented, reinvented myself into a, uh, with a second life. And, and thank you, Eric. I, I agree with your points. Um, I do uh, think that there is this uh, disparity that we see, uh, maybe including even in, in our company uh, here. Um, I think there's a few things. So um, one is, the the level at which it's taken so ceos what they think and then the base if you will or the employees yeah maybe if you ask middle managers and employees maybe different um there is a a possibility that 
CEOs, especially in larger organizations where you have more layers, I'm not talking about a five people, you know, SME, um, uh, sit uh, pretty high in the organization. They look at strategy. They have a role which is, uh, you know, maybe high level and they may not be able to grasp or to have a correct perception of what employees are feeling on the ground. Uh, uh, we only have two layers in our company, but it's not a, it's not a massive company, but still you do see sometimes that, that what I see, uh, at my level is very different from what people see at the level below from, from the next down. Um, that's one thing. I think the, another possibility to explain this disparity, this disconnect is that, um, you know, the, the, the programs that are rolled out sometimes, and there's a lot of money being spent in companies, can be very institutional. So companies will say, we've done this, we've done that. And, you know, you can throw as much money as you want and organize as many things as you want. But if at the level of every employee, they do not feel that they're genuinely listened to and genuinely supported and that their manager uh, who is usually the face, the direct face of the company to them actually really cares about how they're doing outside of work as well. And that this is a constant priority. It won't matter um, um, how many programs you do and how much money you spend. Yeah, no, that that's um, th those are some really good points, I think. Um, and certainly you both of you have really articulated um, the disparity, right? So kind of you have intention and then you have really the, the, the action and then how that kind of translates into as well. If I can then kind of then maybe go into this uh, next question and I think we can really kind of dive a little bit deeper into uh, one of those disconnects that we both have identified. So the survey of a thousand office workers across various markets, US, UK, Singapore, UAE, the statistic here was showing that 24% of these employees are only 24% comfortable speaking to their boss about mental health, but it's even lower in the respondents in Singapore, only 8.5%. Mm. So, you know, just taking a step back and, and thinking about that a little bit, you know, Eric, I'd love to turn to you. I know you've had that perspective of, of, living here in Asia as well as in the US. I wanted to help you maybe maybe help us understand a little bit more about why in Singapore and frankly in other Asia Pacific markets, even including Hong Kong, wh wh why do you think that that number is the case in this yeah. for this for this context? Uh, thanks, thanks, Alan. Um, I'd like to start by just telling a quick anecdote from before I moved to Hong Kong. So I came out before I moved here to visit, uh, set up interviews and things like that with other organizations. And I met a woman for coffee who ended up eventually hiring me and bringing me out to my first job in Hong Kong um, for the first time. And I remember talking to her about the public health campaigns that I was working on when I was back in the US on this uh, for the CDC and the National Institutes of Health. One was a breast cancer awareness campaign for young women, which featured real women who were either survivors, previvors, or at-risk women, sharing their personal experiences, either navigating the risk or even being diagnosed with the disease. Another campaign was related to heart disease and older women, and similarly used real life stories about navigating this disease, risk, and eventual treatment in some instances. And I remember sitting with her at Pacific Coffee and her being very frank and saying, I'm not sure that type of campaign would work here. Mm. And it was such an interesting perspective to me at the time, which of course now five years later, I have a much better understanding of, that even talking about physical health came with such a stigma. Um, and of course, you know, in, in my point of view, that stigma as it relates to mental health is one of those main drivers in not making a conversations in the workplace more frequent or comfortable um, within an Asian context. And, you know, there's certainly cultural nuances to that. I think there's a study that just came out in Singapore earlier this week that said, uh, compared to Western employers, Asian employers perceive people with mental health conditions as less loyal or having poor work ethics. Um, similarly, a Hong Kong study from a few years ago 
found that more than half of Hong Kongers surveyed believe they would be penalized at work for talking about their mental health challenges. So there's a lot of nuances within this, um, you know, that can relate back to things like saving face or negative perceptions around mental illness. But at the end of the day, I think it all boils down to that stigma. Um, I will also say, though, that perhaps in addition to cultural nuances that uh, is giving way to these percentages, it might be also very highly attributed to organizational and team norms like we were talking about before. Um, so maybe just to share a bit of my own experience working at two different companies within Hong Kong. Um, so from my personal lens and why I care so much about this topic, I have generalized anxiety disorder. I've coped with depression, burnout, and panic attacks before. And in my first job in Hong Kong, I was going through a really difficult time and finally got the courage to raise this up to my manager. And unfortunately, the message that I got in return was that this was very normal based on Hong Kong or the industry, that it could be worse and that, well, everyone is going through it, so I should just get on with it also. And so this really made me feel like this was my fault and discouraged me from asking for help and ultimately worsened my mental health. And to me, that really showed that the culture of burning yourself out was not only normalized, but also rewarded in a lot of ways. Um, and you know, to contrast that, I would say since taking on my current role, I've learned in many ways that an environment directly by the team or everyday norms can determine how psychologically safe or supported that you feel. It's not just about the resources that you provided, like Julian was saying before. Um, so now, for example, I have managers who lead by example and sharing how they're taking care of their well-being, who've encouraged me to take leave when I need it, who have now allowed me to feel comfortable saying I need a mental health day or I need to sign off early to go to therapy. It's taken a lot of unlearning, but I think I'm really grateful for these two separate experiences because it's not only taught me, okay, where are the, the cultural nuances potentially and uh, working and uh, working with people from many different cultures on other sides of the world, but even within the same location, what does that look like from an organizational culture? And then how can we work to better that to help each and every person at the end of the day as well? That's, um, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I think your perspectives, your, your personalized experience, I think really there's a lot um, to unpack. And I wish we had more time to really, um, you know, think about how that is. I know, Julianne, you're, you're really deep in thought on, on this as well. I, I kind of wanted to also maybe get your perspective on, on, on this as well. Well, if, if I get deeper on the topic, I don't know how we'll all end, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the session. Uh, but, but um, you know, I, I think all the points that uh, Erica shared are very, uh, very important. Um, uh, we need more of this. I wish there were more people in Hong Kong who could listen to uh, this kind of session, not that, you know, what we say is, um, uh, you know, extraordinary, I think, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, depth is just humans sharing what it's like to go to work every day when uh, you have faced burnout, anxiety, depression, and, and um, what kind of expectation you have from your employer, because you cannot and don't want to stay at home for years and you have to work and you love your work, um, how can they support you in that journey? So, um, generally, uh, for Singapore, I'm, I wouldn't be the best qualified to, to comment because I moved to Hong Kong nine years ago. I used to live in Europe and the US before. Uh, Hong Kong, I know a little bit um, uh, because I live here, work here, and we're building our company and making an impact here. For Hong Kong, I can say that it's generally uh, quite conservative. Uh, I think it's correct as a first uh, maybe impression of Erica to mention that uh, traditionally, uh, you know, talking about health in a work environment, let alone mental health, is not something that is, uh, it's progressing, but it's not something that is very encouraged, very widespread mainstream. Um, now, we, we also have to remember there is a huge disparity of companies, yeah? Uh, uh, overwhelmingly, companies in Hong Kong are SMEs, um, local, local manager, local employees. Um, and uh, you do have, of course, big companies, but in terms of number, the workforce is really in the SMEs, very local culture, um, traditional HR playing a role, which is not very proactive, but a very reactive admin based. Um, and I think we, we sometimes forget that companies like Intellect or Aeon or Alia are, you know, that's not the workforce. That's like less than 1%, 0.1%. Um, so, it's good to start somewhere to try to make an impact in society 
and you have to start with the places where you feel you can have insiders bringing change. But realistically, it's going to take a long time in places like Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, especially as there's also a generational shift. We haven't talked about it much, but you can see a huge difference between the uh, Gen XYZ and the uh, other generations in terms of what they expect and how comfortable they would be to talk about mental health. Uh, that's also a big thing. So it's going to take a few decades maybe um, for a shift to really occur across society. And uh, already today, what you see is uh, a big, big disparity between people who work for tech companies where there's benefits and uh, because of the demographics of the staff, um, uh, a very different sort of environment and, and mental health culture from uh, very sort of traditional companies, which can have 10 to thousands of employees, but very local. There's a deal, we pay you, you work, and uh, we don't expect you to raise your problems with us. Yeah, no, it's important. So thank you guys for, for sharing. I think a lot of the importance of the context around this and, and, and kind of why we are where, we, where we're at. I want to move on to the next question. And I think this will kind of now start really going towards um, some opportunities to kind of help uh, our, our employees in this. And, and so let me set up and frame this question. You know, studies suggest that mental health stigma persists in people reluctant and they're unable to take them off, you know, take that time off uh, when they're unwell. The data published on the HR online indicates that 30% of employees in Hong Kong have, as we alluded to earlier, this hidden mental health issues from their bosses, claiming that they're physically unwell, they're phoning in, they're, they're sick. Mutual trust and respect are core factors that employees seem to not feel from their employers. And so I guess maybe I'll start with Julianne first, you know, kind of aside from your work in Alia, we know that you run a, a health blog, a, you know, a leading health blog in Hong Kong. So just taking into account rising global competition, differences in culture between employees, how, how can organizations help develop key employee res resilience within that workplace? Employee resilience as in? Being able then to kind of move forward because we know that these uh, issues or you know the challenges will still remain. So how, how do we then get employees to help become stronger and, 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 and how they address this? Yeah, so I think it's a it's a it's a journey. Uh, first of all, there I, I don't think there would be a solution where we can get employees when they start in companies uh, at any stage of their life feel equipped to tackle all the obstacles that we all go through in our lives. And I think there's there's two things. There's the uh, stress that can be induced um, in the company itself, and and sort of a toxic environment, of course, will will worsen. Uh, pre-existing symptoms or, or conditions in people and will create a lot of uh, issues in people uh, uh, who will get disengaged and, 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 and worse. Uh, and there are people who are facing, uh, uh, you know, a difficult environment and personal issues and the level of support that they, they expect. So I think that's two, two different things. Um, you can try to uh, uh, create a uh, uh, as much as you want an environment which is uh, free of politics or with less politics, you can try to foster collaboration in your company. You can try to have a place where people enjoy working, um, but you will still need to tackle and be there for people who come in in the morning and may be facing issues and you have to be ready and open and, and trained and your managers have to be trained to handle those feedbacks from people who will come. And even if it's a very nice um, uh, company to work in, uh, will come and have uh, a need for people not to judge them um, or to hear feedback that is very discouraging, like the one that Erica mentioned earlier when she was raising. Uh, and all she needed really was someone to listen and to support her. Uh, not to make a judgment or make it make her feel worse. I think that's the words that she used. So, but for that, you need training uh, because it is not uh, easy. Uh, I also feel personally, but that's, um, I don't know if, if anyone shares the same, that it's 
it's a very difficult uh, uh, job to be a manager. Not everybody wants to be a manager. Um, most of the time what happens is uh, you have a team, whether it's in a, a bank or a food company or whatever, and you have someone who's a very good individual performer. And that individual performer, uh, to reward him, you elevate him to manage a team. But that may not be what he or she wants. Sure, it comes with a raise, but it's a totally different job. So I think being a manager is is being loving to work with people and to be really a people's person. And uh, you also have a lot of people who are in the wrong jobs and it hurts them and it hurts their team because it, they're not doing something they enjoy. They would rather be individual contributors than, than having to manage people's lives. Because when you're at work and you have one-on-ones with your colleagues regularly, you hear about what's going on in their private life, not just their work life. And they expect you to be there to listen to them. And if you're not, um, if it's not something that uh, you feel equipped to do, it's it's going to be very damaging. Because if below you you have five or ten people, you can quickly destroy uh, a lot of the efforts that you're trying to do at the top of the company. Um, I think that to develop the resilience of uh, your people, I don't know if it's something that we should expect framed like that as a question of a company. Huh? So uh, I think that we are all responsible um, uh, for our own, um, you can call it development, happiness. Um, you can call it a path for our own mindset. Um, and I think that as a company, you cannot and shouldn't be there to step too far either, personally, I think, into people's lives uh, to give them a way to think or a way to feel better about themselves. However, you have to be there with a, a, a psychological safety net. That's how we call it here. So you, for me personally, as founder of the company, co-founder of the company, my goal is simple. Whether we have 10 people or 100 or 1,000 people in this company, there's only one thing I care about is to make sure that when people come here in the morning, none of them dreads that moment and has sort of something in the stomach because it's it's not a good place because they feel that there's something wrong or toxic then we don't do everything right but at least if you try to focus on that and make people feel supported and listened to there will always be people who come and go you cannot please everyone but at least i think you will achieve a lot Okay, there's, a, there's, there's, there's some great things you've, you've I think, mentioned. I'm just going to quickly paraphrase. I think you mentioned about, you know, the fostering an environment, and that's very important to help with the collaboration. You mentioned about training, uh, again, and being able then to take conceptual uh, concepts and being able to make them into real applicable behaviors and areas. Uh, you talked about, you know, the importance of of equipping managers. And I think that ties really closely back to the leadership discussion that we had during lunchtime and, and ensuring that all uh, uh, all our employees are, are really uh, placed in a position and resourced. And interesting, you talked about resilience and you said that it wasn't a, it wasn't a company sole responsibility, but really also an individual, as an employee, as an individual, being able to help participate and being able then to work together, I think, you know, with, with the company on some of that. So um, really fascinating points. Thank you so much, uh, Shilin, for that. You know, Eric, I wanted just to, you know, send that question over to you about, you know, how do organizations, how can they design that better work environment uh, mm -hmm. so we can help uh, enable these conversations on mental health and, and try to uh, destigmatize that? Mm. Yeah, thanks. And Julian, I, I, you saw me nodding and writing things down because I think you've done a really nice job at capturing some of those action items. And I think one thing that you mentioned or phrase that you used was around the overall well-being or mental health journey, which I think can be looked at at the individual level, but also the organizational level. So I think it's very easy, and I think we hear this from a lot of our clients, to uh, kind of get overwhelmed in that they feel like they have to do everything at once or they don't know where to start. But I think, like you said, if an organization can identify, okay, what is my main objective in supporting the employee mental health uh, for our colleagues. And then also based on that, what's our current state and where do we want to go? And so being really specific around what that vision is, what their role is to play, and then planning and implementing programs based on that. I think also in addition to skill building around the managerial level or the leadership level, 
Um, something that we're starting to talk about with a few of our clients is also just skill building the entire employee population. So, you know, I think the pandemic has unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, put health at the forefront of so many um, conversations at, at work. And, you know, we've seen an increased uh, intake uh, and take up of programs such as mental health first aid or manager trainings. Um, but we actually had one client in the region where we were going to do a manager training earlier this year. And they said, you know what, we actually want to give these skill building opportunities to all of our employees. So let's promote it to everyone. So I think that there's obviously, you know, certain nuances of relationships that come from a manager and direct report, but also kind of democratizing the support system within an organization to ensure that all employees have that opportunity to support one another. Um, and other you know, tactics that we've seen are uh, employing mental health first aiders. So if there are people who are particularly passionate uh, about mental health and supporting their colleagues, really uh, bringing that to the forefront, providing that specific training, and then also uh, communicating that these people are here to be a resource, which also might be a safer space for employees outside of their direct manager or HR. So almost having a third party uh, resource in that sense as well. Um, and I would also say that in addition to this, I think it's very easy to think of training as the, the hardcore learning or learning the exact checklist of what to follow if someone's having a mental health crisis. I think creating these avenues of connection for people to learn about real people's lived experiences. So there's studies that show that just exposure to people with a mental health condition can help decrease stigma. Um, as I think Mag mentioned at the beginning, outside of work, I'm also an ambassador for Mind Hong Kong. And that is a role where I'm a part of a storytelling campaign where it's a diverse group of uh, individuals living with different mental health conditions, sharing their experiences uh, through media opportunities, different events. And I've also had that opportunity to do that with NA on a, a few different touch points. And I've seen firsthand, you know, that value of being open and honest and vulnerable about, about your uh, own mental health experience or other people's mental health experiences, how that normalizes mental health challenges. It helps other people feel like they're not alone, remind people that it can and will get better and can encourage people to ask for help. So in addition to maybe the I would say the harder training or the more education-based training, ensuring that there's that component of storytelling built in as well to help normalize conversations around mental health and mental health conditions. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I know we still have about 10 minutes here. I, I really would like to kind of explore this area a little bit more, I, I, you know, because I think if, if you were to kind of give maybe uh, to our listeners out there on companies who can really help narrow this, you know, it, it get closer to the individuals around some of this, maybe what, what is kind of one area you would love to say, you'd love to see uh, potentially unlocked um, and, and help maybe bridge this a little bit closer. What's, what's a, a piece of advice maybe you would want to give to, to the companies out there who, who want to try and, um, make take that effort and make that opportunity first maybe julian i'll ask you first well i think as an area it would be really um, um i would say more than programs uh, uh changing the culture really just equipping across the company uh not in one uh, area in particular uh and it's hard and we we've, we've tried here and it's it's not easy so i'm not saying that we're good at it or perfect we've tried with you know some success and some failures but uh, equipping the company with the ability and managers responsibility of uh listening and being there uh and so that it trickles down and that ultimately um in a company everyone can feel that they can be accepted as they are, that they can be who they really are, that they don't have to put a happy hat for six months or one year, um, because that can be terrible um, in every way if they're not feeling well, and that the, the company feels that responsibility. And we haven't even talked about retention, and you know, but that it's the company's responsibility to beyond words to actually uh, uh, walk the talk and really uh, uh, that it's sort of a prerequisite that that when you start a company uh, just like there are so many now 
rules and procedures on many aspects to make sure that there's no discrimination on so many topics. It is also a prerequisite that people are trained and understand their responsibility to listen to employees. That should be a, a first for any employee at any level in any company. Yeah. Erica, what's what's kind of your, your piece of advice that you would, you would want to give to the business and the HR community? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a great point and kind of, yeah, what is the baseline prerequisite of how to be a supportive colleague or leader and, and listen? I think that's, that's such a key word there because it's not always about, you know, providing that support directly. It's just, can you be that safe space for, for your colleagues, for your, for your team members as well? Um, I think outside of kind of normalizing mental health conversations, using inclusive language in our day-to-day -day ways that we talk to each other, um, I think the other piece more broadly is back to the point around measurement. So, you know, really taking a step back at looking, okay, if we have this perception gap between uh, what we think we're doing well versus actual utilization of programs or perception of programs, that might be our hypothesis, but are we actually capturing this? And how can we really get the most insights based on the, the metrics that we have available to make our program as strategic, as impactful as possible? So I think it's very typical and very easy to have you know, benefits utilization or claims data in one avenue, communications or internal communications metrics in another avenue, different types of program or app. Um, or policy utilization and other avenue, but actually looking at all of this holistically in addition to things like engagement data or employee feedback surveys can really help paint that more true and honest picture around the current environment. And then you're able to then leverage those insights in the most effective way possible to shape your mental health strategy, your well-being strategy, and support your employees at the end of the day. And of course, you know, again, that's mapped to taking that step back and thinking, what is our role to play for the employees that we're serving? Where does our organization currently and where do we want to go? So really taking that holistic approach to measurement, strategy and planning is so important, I think, especially when it's very easy to, to move fast and be reactive and, and the well-being space too with implementing certain programs depending on employee need. Oh, that's great, that's lovely. You know, thank you again for this session. Um, I, I, I love the fact that uh, both of you, Erica and Julia, made it so simple. And, and, and so just being able to share kind of the, uh, a portfolio of kind of hard skills, soft skills, the participation, um, the fact that you can share, that doesn't cost anything, <laughs> you know, to, to any company, right? It's, it's truly, truly, tru truly showing authenticity uh, around some of this. And it, it, it can very quickly improve and unlock so much and, and bridge that gap. Uh, between between companies and employees, so really um, appreciate your time, appreciate your um, your your stories and your experiences to 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 how we can uh, together uh, bring bring this really forward. So thank you again for your time, really very very much. So thank you, Alan. Thanks so much. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.